Hello everyone, my name is Mario Martinez and this is Amateur EMS. So to start off with, what is aspirin? Why did we use aspirin? So, aspirin is an antiplatelet medication that decreases platelets' ability to be able to form clots. So, that's a very fancy definition, but what does that mean for my chest pain patients? So, to break it down further, so, when our patients have chest pain, one of our biggest concerns is potential chance for a STEMI. What is a STEMI? It is ST elevation causing a myocardial infarction, also known as a heart attack. So let's go ahead and break this definition down further. So to start off, let's look at ST elevation. So what is ST elevation? So if we look electrically at a patient's normal heart, we'll see that they have a P wave, sometimes a Q wave, depending on their circumstances, it can change at times. Uh, an R wave, an S wave, and a T wave. Now, for a patient who has ST elevation or possible heart attack, we can see here that we have a P wave. Sometimes a Q wave will be present, sometimes it won't. The R wave, and we can see that the S and the T have merged together and are appearing elevated, such as the one being displayed here. So this is ST elevation. So next, we have the last couple words being myocardial infarction. Now that's a really big word, but let's break it down. So first right here, we have myo, and for myo, we can think of muscular tissue, right? Now with cardial, we think of cardiac, so we can think of the heart. So all this is talking about is the muscular tissue around the heart, myocardial. And infarction, you just generally have to know this term as long as ischemia, it means a lack of oxygen. So what we're saying here is an ST elevation causing a muscular heart to receive a lack of oxygen, or a STEMI, ST elevation causing a myocardial infarction, a lack of oxygen to the heart. So now that we have a deeper understanding of STEMI or heart attack, where does aspirin come into play? So we first need to think of the heart being a muscular tissue that has its own arteries and veins. Now, I didn't draw the veins on here. You can see some of the arteries being the circumflex artery, the left and the right coronary artery, the right marginal artery, and the anterior interventricular artery. Now there are a lot of more uh, veins on the heart that I haven't drawn up on here, such as the ones on the posterior side of it or the back side of it. One other thing to note that may help you, especially if you're taking a &P 1 and 2, is a lot of people get confused with the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary artery. The best way to think about it is instead of thinking arteries as oxygenated blood and veins as deoxygenated blood, instead think of it as arteries being blood that goes away from the heart and veins that go towards the heart. That'll make a lot more sense with the oxygenated blood being in pulmonary veins for you and the deoxygenated blood being in the pulmonary arteries. But that's going a little bit off topic. So, so now we can see an enlarged view of an artery, such as the depiction here. So over time, as you progress, you start off initially with a clean artery. But as we eat fatty foods, or sometimes you can have a pregenetic disposition that causes cholesterol to accumulate more in your bloodstream, you might start to develop some uh, cholesterol that attaches itself to the arterial wall. How does our body combat this? It sends white blood cells as well as muscular cells around this area and it creates almost a mound or a plaque buildup like so and it creates a very thin layer. This is known as atherosclerosis. So we can see here that the passageway to feed oxygen to our muscular tissue, in this instance being our heart, is being slightly narrowed and this can uh, occur multiple times throughout our lifetime. That's why it's important to do things such as checking your carotid arteries uh, once every year or so, depending on your age group. I'm not a physician though, so please talk to your physician and do whatever he requests. So what can happen is over time, these very thin layers that are protecting our plaque rupture. And what happens whenever this ruptures? Well, our body will detect this. It may consider this as an injured site where platelets that normally uh, form clots around other scratches or injury sites will detect this injury and will send platelets and other white blood cells to this rich fatty lipid area and 
with a, an accumulation of fibrin will de develop clots that may fully impact this area. And so to diminish the effect of the platelets aggregating to this area, we administer a patient aspirin, also known as an antiplatelet medication. So whenever our heart is being almost or completely cut off of oxygen from one of the arteries I displayed earlier, uh, our heart starts to scream out because it's getting a lack of oxygen. It's almost being choked to death because it's not being supplied with oxygen. It screams out in pain. And so you get this horrible chest pain because it's triggering the vagal nerves via the cardiac plexus that forms around the heart. So it's screaming out pain at the same time. It's releasing enzymes known as CK, CKMB, troponin, and a couple other enzymes that I'm not going to discuss today. Whenever these enzymes are being released and it's screaming in pain, it's because of this formation of this plaque buildup, as well as the platelet, platelet aggregation in the artery. So what does aspirin do? Aspirin can bind to COX-1. And COX-1, in addition to a couple other enzymes, can induce and start up the process of platelet aggregation. So aspirin comes in, it can bind to inhibit the effect of COX-1's enzyme to where it reduces or completely inhibits platelet aggregation or formation. So for aspirin, we don't administer aspirin as a cure, but we administer it as a preventative. So we don't disrupt any clots or we don't break up any clots, but instead we try to prevent them from getting worse. That's why we administer it in the field. So for aspirin, check with your medical director. It could be different according to your protocols and you should always check protocols before you listen to somebody else's description of it. But for the most part, aspirin is administered uh, at 324 milligrams via PO. And PO basically means oral or by the mouth. Now, you need to make sure that they're not allergic to aspirin. So you need to ask if they have any allergies. And what you're looking for is salicyclates. A lot of times they won't know that name, but they might just know that they're allergic to salicyclates. But I find that this is a very rare allergy, but it's still worth checking for your patient. Also, your patient may have been prescribed a baby aspirin especially if they have an affinity for plaque buildup or if they have talked to a cardiologist in the past. A baby aspirin's dosage is usually 81 milligrams. They may also be taking what's called a big aspirin or 324 milligrams, although this is a lot more rare. So if your patient has taken 81 milligrams in one day uh, on the day that you're seeing them, what you can do is give them three additional aspirins or baby aspirins to reach the max dose of 324 milligrams. From there, if you discern that it is actually a true heart attack or you can see it electrically, uh, go according to your protocols, but most likely it's going to be code three to a hospital that has cardiac facilities. I hope you enjoyed this explanation of aspirin. I know we went a little bit more in depth than we had to do, but I felt like we can always go a little bit further, so why not? Um, if you believe that I misspoke about anything, or if there's something that you want to ask about or have any questions, please leave a comment and I'll get back to it. I'm going to leave all my references in the description below, so please check them out if, uh, at your own leisure. Besides that though, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.